Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us online for tonight's lecture with Tamara K. Nupper, titled Anti-Asian Violence and Black Asian Solidarity Today. We are delighted to welcome Tamara and we look forward to learning alongside all of you this evening. My name is Jeffrey Nundin and I'm the Executive Director of the Asian American Writers Workshop and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual stage. We hope you all are taking care. We are sending love and light to everyone in our community, particularly after last week's murderous attack in Atlanta. For those of you who are new to the Asian American Writers Workshop, welcome. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. At a time when our communities are specifically vulnerable, we continue to offer a space in which we can imagine a more just future. Among the programs we oversee, including a robust calendar of public events and fellowship programs that support emerging writers of color, we are proud to support the editorial collaboration between the Black Women Radicals and the Asian American Feminist Collective, which has found a home in our award-winning online magazine, The Margins. The Black and Asian Feminist Solidarities Project is an ongoing commitment to practicing solidarity and asking ourselves, what does it mean to hold space together? To grieve, to heal, to rest, to express joy, and to be accountable. This project looks to Black and Asian American feminist histories, practices, and frameworks on care, community, and survival for the tools and strategies needed to build toward collective liberation. It's a beautiful and necessary partnership, and I hope you'll follow along and read the work that's been published thus far on aaww.org. During tonight's event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged, and the person will be removed from this event. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end of the lecture, and you can ask your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're with us on Zoom, or in the chat box if you're joining us on YouTube. I'm going to briefly introduce Tamara, and then we will bring her on screen to start the lecture. Tamara K. Knopper is a sociologist, writer, editor, and data artist with experience teaching in Asian American studies and ethnic studies, and working with and for Asian American community and anti-war organizations. Her research focuses on Black Korean conflict and the racial and gender wealth gap, financialization, criminalization, punishment, and the social impact of technology. She's the editor, editor of We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transforming Justice, a book of Marianne Cobb's writings and interviews published by Haymarket Books. She also researched and wrote several data stories for Colin Kaepernick's Abolition for the People series. Again, thank you so much, Tamara, for joining us tonight and all of you who are with us online. Over to you, Tamara. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Jeffreen, for the introduction. And... Um, I want to first thank uh, T and Lily for um, helping me organize this. I really appreciate all the work you've put into it. I want to thank um, Stephanie and Dresden for providing ASL and closed captioning. And I also want to thank Jeffreen for the introduction. So um, we, I was told we have over 2,600 people who RSVP'd for this talk and uh, that's a lot. And um, I think this moment has, and the, um, the moment and the attention to this moment has generated a lot of interest, a lot of questions and a lot of soul searching. Um, and I don't take that lightly. And um, so just a little bit, um, just to say, I pitched this uh, presentation to AAWW um, at the end of February, actually. And then as you know, uh, with the murders of people in Atlanta, um, this conversation has kind of um, uh, become an even bigger conversation and has gotten kind of more attention. So um, I want to kind of think through some of the things that I was noticing um, and to think about kind of some of the, the kind of patterns of responses that I was seeing and to think about kind of some of the ways that we're moving as Asian Americans in this conversation, particularly against the backdrop of concerns about COVID-19, both as a public health crisis, but also because of the way that Asian Americans have been attacked, as well as uh, against the backdrop of 
increased calls for defund the police and abolition. This is a very um, interesting for, you know, lack of a better word, political moment. And to think about kind of anti-Asian violence and black Asian solidarity and the way forward um, is really uh, kind of a major task, I think, for a lot of us. So I'm going to, um, we're gonna do a presentation here. This presentation is a lecture and, you know, unlike um, I, I've been teaching college classes for about 20 years now. So uh, I'm getting used to the Zoom stuff, but unlike the um, college classes I teach, I'm really gonna be focused on my presentation and we'll do all the Q and A at the end. So it won't be as interactive as my college classes. So um, let me share my screen here. Let's get started. So my presentation is called Anti-Asian Violence and Black Asian Solidarity Today. And part of it is thinking about kind of the landscape of what Black Asian solidarity politics look like in this current moment, especially as conversations about Asian Americans confronting anti-Blackness have occurred. I'm thinking about this in relationship to these issues here, right? So we're gonna be looking at these topics. And um, part of it is, I wanted to start with a brief history of anti-Asian violence during the 1980s and late 1990s. Um, for some of us, this will be a review. For some of us, it will be an introduction. Um, and this is something where, you know, uh, we often talk about, for those of us who talk about kind of the history of Asian American organizing, we often go to the 60s and the 70s um, of the Asian American movement. But this generation of organizers um, and those of us who are, you know, middle aged bitches like me, we're in, you know, we're following in the footsteps of the 1980s and the late 1990s. And there was a lot of organizing around anti-Asian violence that was going on in Asian American organizations that this is part of the landscape that we're inheriting as Asian American activists and as people thinking through some of these issues. And so I wanted to spotlight some of the, um, some major cases, but also I wanted to spotlight some of the organizations that were working in that. We're then gonna be thinking about some of the issues around hate crime laws and hate crime statistics. And this is gonna to relate to the um, COVID-19 hate crime law and the No Hate Act that have been proposed. As we're gonna think about, you know, what does it mean that we're having kind of um, increased, you know, calls for hate crime laws, but ones that are also thinking about the particularity of this moment and ones that are kind of targeted for um, trying to protect Asian Americans from racial violence. We're gonna be thinking about the Stop Asian Hate hashtag. I have some concerns about that hashtag. Um, people might have noticed this, they might not have. I've never used that hashtag and I'm very intentional about that. And I'm gonna share why I haven't used that hashtag um, and what I'm concerned about in terms of what it might be mobilizing in terms of carcerality. Then we're getting to kind of, you know, the focus about Black Asian solidarity, which has gotten a lot of attention in this moment and we're gonna be thinking about, um, you know, uh, as Doreen, and thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, as uh, they noted, uh, one of my areas of scholarship is black Korean conflict. It's something that I've studied for decades. And so I looked a lot at kind of what was black Asian solidarity discourse in the post 1992 Los Angeles rebellion um, era. And today, you know, we're thinking about kind of um, post Black Lives Matter or Black Lives Matter is still with us, of course. Um, but we're thinking about kind of what does Black Asian solidarity discourse look like today in the context of Black Lives Matter and in the context of defund the police and so forth, right? Um, so this is the trajectory where we're going, but we're starting here and we're gonna go here, okay? Now, I wanna return back to this image. This is a photo and I, unfortunately, I don't know who the photographer is. Um, Josie Wang uh, posted this, she is a journalist. Um, and this was from a rally, a vigil, excuse me, um, in uh, San Gabriel Valley, California, which if you don't know, has a significant number of Asian Americans living there. So I just wanna start by um, uh, remembering um, the victims of uh, the violence and of the killings in Atlanta and so forth. <clears throat> so, Many of you are probably familiar with Vincent Chin and Vincent Chin was an Asian American man. He was Chinese American. He was bludgeoned by two white auto workers, Michael Nitz and Ronald Evans, who were related um, and he was bludgeoned. And then a few days later he died. And this was in 1982 Detroit. 
And one of the things that's really interesting is that I know some people who kind of have Vincent chin fatigue, meaning, uh, you know, some people will say, some Asian Americans will say, well, you know, we hear only about Vincent chin or Vincent chin is the only case. And so the Vincent chin case has the significance in kind of Asian American activism and Asian American studies um, and in organizing projects. Uh, in you know, 2002, I was part of an organization, I participated in an Asian arts organization. Uh, if you can believe it, I was actually involved in art. <laughs> and if, if you know me, you would be like, oh, word, because I'm not really you know, artistic in some ways. But we had a commemoration for Vincent Chin and I was part of a Korean drumming group and we drummed for him. And in Detroit, they had, you know, uh, with Grace Lee Boggs and them in Detroit summer, they had a commemoration for Vincent Chin and for the 20th anniversary of his murder. And one of the things about this case is sometimes you'll hear Asian Americans say, well, Asian Americans don't experience as much racial violence as other groups. We only have Vincent Chin, right? And so, they, so Vincent Chin will be used as kind of the example that gets overdrawn or maybe over talked about. Some people will say, say it, say, well, Asian Americans have experienced more racial violence than Vincent Chin. Why is this the only case that gets, um, you know, interest? I will say that one of the things I think, I think we actually could study this case more. Most of our knowledge about the Vincent Chin case comes from the film, Who Killed Vincent Chin, which is a very important documentary by Renee Tajima Pina. And also, um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting her name. I'm sorry, there's another Asian American uh, filmmaker and I'm totally forgetting her name. And part of the reason why her filmmaking is so significant is because she was one of the founders of Third World Newsreel, the documentary film series that used kind of guerrilla artwork and so forth. Um, and so somebody in the chat might be able to correct me. I apologize about that. I know tonight I'm gonna be thinking and I'm gonna remember her name, right? Uh, someone is raising their hand, okay. <laughs> um, hold on one second, let me go to the chat. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to close the race hand thing. So one of the things is here you see, um, Jesse Jackson and, you know, Scott Kershage, who's a historian who, um, also, uh, lived and worked in Detroit for years and is a co-author with Grace Lee Bog. He had a, a Twitter thread where he gave more insight into kind of some of the um, race and geography politics of the murder of Vincent Chin. And he gave a lot, uh, he gave kind of an urban historian perspective of it. And he also talked about the significance of Jesse Jackson uh, supporting Vincent Chin um, as part of kind of a rainbow coalition project. What was also important was this was a case that was um, they, they built a movement around this case. So you had Asian Americans for Justice and so forth, um, but they built a national campaign and it also went international to an extent. And some of this has to do with, you know, when we think about ethnic media and we think about, um, you know, international media that pays attention to this stuff. And we're seeing this right now um, with Korean media and Chinese media and so forth. So this case galvanized a lot of people. And one of the significances of this case was, um, the Department of Justice brought federal charges against Eben and Nitz for violating Vincent Chin's uh, civil rights. And um, this is something we're gonna talk about in relationship to hate crime policy. But this was the first case of the DOJ investigating, you know, um, investigating on behalf of an Asian American of having their uh, civil rights violated um, through violence. And so this case has a lot of significance that I think more of us could actually study. Um, so here, this is a rally in um, New York, right? And this is um, Asian Americans for Equality. And they were an organization, they're still around, and they were started in the 1970s. And some of their organizing had to do with um, organizing around Confucius Plaza, organizing, um, you know, um, uh, for workers, for, you know, around wages, around, you know, being able to get access to jobs and so forth, right? And so what you see here, right, is you see, you know, um, and they had a lot of Chinese Americans who were part of their organization, but what you see is, you know, um, different Asian ethnic groups, um, and you see that the case of Vincent Chin takes on this national significance where other organizations are dealing with it. This is Yuri Kochiyama. I just, you know, around these parts, we like Yuri Kochiyama. And so, you know, I just really have a thing for Yuri Kochiyama. For those who don't know, she, you know, was an organizer. Um, she was part of Asian American organizations. Her husband, Bill Kochiyama, was a part of Asian American organizing as well. And this is her winning an award 
from AAFE. Um, some of her organizing involved, activism involved um, protesting on behalf of the workers who weren't getting access at Confucius Plaza. So I just want to include a picture of Yuri Kochiyama because I just really like her. Okay. So this is part of a timeline from Asian Americans United. And Asian Americans United was founded in 1985 in Philadelphia, and they're still around. And they organize in Chinatown and also in South Philly. And so, you know, um, here, one of the things is you have, they have timelines about different campaigns they were involved in. These two cases, Heng Lim, and then this is a case involving seven Asian defendants. These were mainly, you know, Southeast Asian uh, youth and uh, Heng Lim was a Southeast Asian man and they were getting harassed by racist white people in South Philly. And, you know, for those who don't know, South Philly, um, you know, if you talk to people who are, you know, older in South Philly and of people of color, it's kind of known like, you know, white people in South Philly really messed with people of color and black people. Um, and there was a lot of racial conflict and, and directed from white people. And one of the things is, is that AAU, and there's actually not a lot written about the McCreech playground incident. And this kind of, you know, this is another example of why we need more organizers to really kind of write about and document about some of their campaigns, because you actually can't find a lot written about McCreech. But this case was really important because one of the things is, is that um, a white person got killed in the process. And so, you know, this organization, AAU, Asian American United, they took up defending the Asian defendants and that was not a popular position to take, right? Um, because these Asian defendants were accused of, um, you know, killing a white person or participating in some ways. And what AAU did was they talked about the social context of this group called White Power Boys. And they talked about the context of racial violence and of racial intimidation that Southeast Asians were um, facing regularly. And they defended uh, these Asian defendants and, and they provided different forms of political support. Scott Kershage, who I had mentioned already, has an article in the Journal of Asian American Studies about AAU's organizing around this. And again, there's not a lot written about this. So that's a very important uh, article to understand some of these things. This is Ricky Birdsong. And I remember when this happened and I was watching the news. Um, so Ricky Birdsong was a former coach, uh, basketball coach at Northwestern University. And um, uh, in 1999, a white man, a young white man went and he went on a rampage throughout the Midwest. And he um, shot at um, Asians, black people and Jews. And he injured um, several Jewish people and Ricky Birdsong was killed. And Ricky Birdsong was um, with his children. Luckily his children survived. Unfortunately, Ricky Birdsong did not. <clears throat> and this is Wang Jun Yoon and he was um, killed as well. And he was a Korean um, grad student. He was from Korea and he was a grad student at Indiana University. And that's how far this man drove. He went from, um, you know, the neighborhood of Rogers Park in Chicago to Indiana University, right? And um, he was a grad student in the economics department. And he was killed. And this is in 1999. And I remember watching the news at the time and there was all this debate about should we, you know, um, I remember there was this concern that um, authorities had not alerted the public that they should be concerned about this man going on the shooting spree. And I remember watching that on TV and just thinking, you know, wow, like, you know, they didn't really warn people of color that there was a man driving around throughout different states, right, um, doing this. So um, in 1999, this man, Buford O'Neill Furrow, went um, on a rampage and he killed, um, he basically targeted people um, of, uh, who were non-white. And one of those people he killed was Joseph Aletto, right? And Joseph Aletto is Filipino American. Um, but one of the things that Furrow said is he decided to kill uh, Joseph Aletto on a whim after he had gone around um, uh, um, shooting at other people because he thought he was either Hispanic or Asian, right? Um, and so Joseph Aletto here, okay. This is also 1999, right? 
Now, in Jersey City, um, you know, there was a group called the Dot Busters. And the Dot Busters was a group of uh, white supremacist people who wanted to, who were um, writing open letters about uh, what they saw as being taken over by uh, South Asian Americans. And so um, what you had was, um, uh, South Asian Americans were experiencing lots and lots of different type of violence. And so, for example, um, you, if you look at some of the news stories at the time, and they just list like all these kind of incidents of violence and, and physical violence, but also um, vandalism to Asian businesses and so forth. And what's deep is if you read some of the, um, if you read some of the, um, like the police officers at the time in some of these news stories, they say, oh, so, you know, these Indians, when they're, you know, just having a problem, they'll just keep calling the police. And they really downplayed a lot of this violence. And so this started getting more attention and you see more um, South Asians protesting um, uh, in Jersey City um, after the murder of um, uh, this man here, Navroz Modi, right? Now, what's really interesting about this, because part of what I want to think about in this presentation is, you know, I'm thinking about not just kind of the, the political legacy that we inherit, but I'm thinking a lot about the narratives of Asian America that we inherit. And I think about, you know, um, what are the narratives that we have available to us, to, uh, what it means to be Asian American, what it means to think about Asian Americans and racial politics, and in this moment, what it means to think about Asian Americans and racial violence, and what we think, quote unquote, our response as Asian Americans should be politically. And so one of the things that's really fascinating about this is that, you know, there's not actually a lot written about the dot busters and what was happening here. But this was a group that I grew up learning about. And I grew up in, you know, the Midwest in the coolest city ever, Toledo, Ohio, right? I mean, I'm saying that with no shade. I really like Toledo, Ohio. I'm totally being serious here. And so um, one of the things is I knew about this because I was reading kind of Asian American literature and I was reading, you know, books about being Asian American in some of these places where it was available, where I could find these books. But the way the dot busters, you know, this is something I want to kind of sort out here because this is an important part about when we think about interracial violence and our kind of political responses to it. So the dot busters were a group of white people who were, you know, going around and, um, uh, and playing up on the bindi, right? That's why it was called the dot busters, the red bindi. And, um, and they were, you know, putting out threatening material about trying to, you know, kill Indians or trying to, you know, uh, run them out, right? And so if you see references to dot busters, right? Like sometimes you'll see essays that people write about being South Asian American and what it means to be South Asian American in the face of racial violence. And you'll see the dot busters mentioned, but what doesn't get mentioned is, you know, who were actually the people that, um, uh, were charged with killing uh, Navrez Modi. And so Navrez Modi's murder gets put into this conversation of the dot busters, right? But he was actually killed um, uh, by some Latino youth, right? Um, and so there are about 11 Latino youth, uh, according to the testimonies, they made fun of him and then they got into a big conflict and then they, you know, it kept going, right? And one of the things about this is that um, in this case, um, you know, they wanted, uh, they wanted the four young people to be tried as adults. And I was reading the other day, the testimony of one of the young people who went to prison at 15 for, um, the death of Navarez Modi. And he talked about feeling a lot of remorse and just doing, um, a lot of work to kind of try to help quote unquote at risk youth in his community in New Jersey um, and just not wanting other people to kind of get caught up in the system. And so this is something that I think we also, you know, this is part of what we're grappling with right now, right? What does it mean to kind of think about um, interracial violence and interracial violence that isn't always kind of, you know, on this level of like a mass shooting and so forth, right? But stuff that happens in the course of kind of, you know, people messing with each other, people, you know, arguing on the street and getting into a fight and so forth. But it's also this question that I think, you know, we should be exploring. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more later about what does it mean that the story about kind of white supremacist racial violence in a group like the Dot Busters, 
that busters who are trying to kind of claim a white space and are willing to use or threaten to use violence to try to protect white space. And what does it mean that the story of this man's death, Mr. Modi's death, by Latino youth and teenagers who get tried as adults eventually, right? Um, which if you look at, you know, if you look at the race data, who gets tried as adults tends to be very racially skewed, right? Um, towards black and Latino youth in terms of getting tried as adults. And so how does this story get kind of collapsed in the story about white supremacy and about kind of um, uh, South Asians being, you know, um, uh, threatened uh, in terms of white racial violence, okay? Now, one thing is Asian Americans respond in a variety of ways. So in some cases they had protests, right? And, uh, you know, CAV, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence, they did protests in support of South Asians as well. And so you see, you know, this kind of solidarity that's being built among different Asian American organizations regarding protesting racial violence. Um, and so another thing they do is they start to put out a lot of material about kind of, you know, what can you do to prevent a hate crime, right? Um, they try to make this material sometimes available in different languages. And so what you start to see in the 1980s and 1990s is kind of a growing kind of conversation about hate crime specifically against Asian Americans. And this is something that's happening among, let's say an organization like um, APELC, right? Asian Pacific American Legal Center and some of the civil rights organizations that we associate with kind of, um, you know, uh, working on legislation or kind of policy, but it's also happening among the organizations that we often claim as radical organizations. And so, you know, for example, we're going to get to Cab in a moment. This is a photo of Joseph Aletto's family. And Joseph Aletto became very involved in um, kind of pushing around uh, conversations about hate crimes and telling the story of, uh, um, of Joseph Aletto. And so this is something where you also have these organizations like APELC and others working with the victims of racial violence and um, the family members, excuse me, and loved ones um, of the victims of racial violence. And so part of what we're doing here is we're kind of galvanizing a conversation about what it means to be Asian American and what it means to be Asian American, um, both in relationship to white supremacy, but also in relationship to um, uh, what it means to be Asian American politically in terms of how we respond to white supremacy and white racial violence, right? And so this is why I think the 80s and the 90s are really important for us to study because this is kind of, you know, a lot of people are going back to kind of the Chinese Exclusion Act or they're talking about, you know, sometimes the Korean War and the Vietnam War. These are important things for us to historicize. But we, this is really the most immediate um, in terms of kind of the political legacy of discourses of racial violence and also of organizational infrastructures regarding how we combat it. So CAV, CAV originally started in 1986 as the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. Today they go by, they keep CAV as kind of a recognizable uh, moniker, but now it's organizing Asian communities. And one of the things is, as they talk about, it originally came out of response to rising anti-Asian violence across the country, including the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982. And so again, this is why, you know, I think it's important for us to study the case of Vincent Chin's um, murder uh, in terms of understanding, you know, for a lot of reasons, but understanding the uh, galvanizing uh, and the building of kind of Asian American um, organizations and political infrastructure, right? And so one of the things that CAB did was they have their newsletter, The Voice, right? And you can find a lot of the copies online. Um, Minju Bay, who is a historian and um, a fellow Temple University grad like me, um, she has done a lot of nice stuff online um, uh, archiving some of CAB's work. Um, and so you can look up Minju Bay and look up some of her work, but you can also find a lot of these newsletters available on CAB's website itself. And one thing they do is they were talking about different kind of, they would do local incidents of violence or harassment, and then they would also do national incidents, right? And if you look at, you know, the incidents, it goes everything from, you know, it, go, it cuts across class. So you have sometimes, you know, working class people, poor people, a lot of international students are getting murdered or beaten um, uh, and so forth. And so, and across ethnicity as well. And so it's a range of different Asian ethnic groups who are experiencing this violence um, in these incidents. 
And what you see here too is CAV has often organized against police brutality and against what we would call state violence. So state violence in this case, you know, being either the police, being, um, you know, a non-responsive city governments, being um, at that time, it would have been the INS, Immigration and Nationality Service, but it would now be ICE, right? And it would be, you know, Department of Homeland Security. And so this is kind of important for us, I think, to consider because what happens today is sometimes people will kind of say, well, you have kind of the radical organizations that deal with state violence, and then you have kind of the more, you know, liberal leaning organizations that deal with violence in this way. But you actually see with some of these organizations kind of combinations of tactics and approaches. For example, CAV, you know, was pushing for, if you look at some of their newsletters, they were pushing for the city government to intervene. And they were talking about, you know, how Mayor David Dinkins versus other, you know, uh, people in the city, you know, um, were kind of responding to things and so forth. And so part of studying these organizations is also, you know, it's about thinking about the landscape of racial violence that they were uh, uh, trying to confront, right? This is not a new conversation as many people have pointed out. And it's also looking at like, what were things that they tried to do to try to protect Asian Americans? I mean, this is a pretty big task. What does it mean to try to protect ourselves, right? And how do we organizationally try to do that? And what does it mean to do that in a non-carceral way is an increasing question that we're now asking in this era of kind of an accelerated conversation about defund the police and abolishing the police, right? What are non-carceral ways to protect ourselves? And you see, you know, glimmers in these organizations of people trying to sort out this bigger question. What does it mean to kind of draw attention to racial violence? What is, how do we measure racial violence? And how do we try to protect ourselves, right? And what are the resources or institutions we're trying to hold accountable? So I, I, again, I would say we need to kind of study these organizations more to understand what we're inheriting, right? So this is Marky Mark. So one, I just want to say, you know, CAB did some creative stuff. So MIA, Murder in America, Hate Crimes Against Southeast Asians, right? But this is Marky Mark, and some of you know him as Mark Wahlberg, right? Um, and so uh, I've noticed on social media, people kind of resurrecting pictures of him saying, hey, you know, let's remember Marky Mark and so forth. And so Marky Mark um, had uh, gotten in trouble for he... Um, he never served time for a 1986 incident in which he um, threw rocks and said racial epithets, including the N-word, at a group of um, Black young people on a school trip, who, are, who the young people are on a school trip. And the judge um, basically was like, well, almost kind of like a probation type of thing. And I'm using that word loosely here because probation means something specific in the criminal justice system. But it was almost this kind of probation thing of saying, hey, we're going to you know, see if you're gonna repeat this behavior. So in 1988, he um, attacked two Asian men um, at a store um, and, you know, and so forth. And it was, um, you know, people were buying beer and so forth. And so this is a protest um, when Marky Mark became a Calvin Klein kind of uh, poster uh, boy, right? A poster boy, they're using that kind of pejoratively. But when he became, you know, an endorsement uh, person. And this was at the height of his kind of, you know, good vibrations, uh, you know, uh, phase and all that uh, in terms of his music career. And so CAV organized and also, um, you know, uh, different organizations um, to protest this, right? And so this is an example when we're thinking about ways that people try to have kind of maybe a non-carceral response, right? Holding kind of, you know, a company accountable for um, giving somebody a platform and, and so forth, especially somebody who, um, Marky Mark has kind of never shown a lot of remorse, right? Now, one of the things that happens is we're going to revisit Marky Mark in a, um, a little bit later because uh, recently Marky Mark tried to um, apply for a pardon from Massachusetts and Asian Americans responded to that. And I think Asian Americans response to that, um, it, it raises important questions for us to think about in terms of kind of non-carceral uh, responses to racial violence. Okay. So this is information, we're gonna now transition to talking about kind of contemporary hate crime laws because part of what you had in the 1980s and 1990s was these organizations talking about racial violence and some of them actively becoming involved in 
pushing for tougher hate crimes. Some of these Asian American organizations also pushed for um, city governments to respond. Sometimes they got involved in hearings, right? So you had a range of organizations that focused on Muslims, Jews, um, you know, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and they would get involved in all these different levels of kind of hate crime policy, including things like, you know, what should be parole for people who were convicted of hate crimes, right? And so they're, they're participating in all these conversations about hate crimes. So we're going to switch a little bit to talking about hate crimes because one of the things that we see is we see this you know, kind of debate about was something a hate crime, right? And so the word hate crime gets used, the phrase hate crime gets used quite loosely. We saw how offensive um, you know, the police handled uh, the white man who killed the 21 year old white man who killed eight people in Atlanta. And so, you know, uh, asking, you know, was it racist and saying, oh, he said it wasn't right. Um, we saw the one, you know, um, Atlanta police officials say, oh, he had a bad day, right? And one of the things that you see in these moments where um, is you see people say, oh, are you gonna call it a hate crime or not? And so calling something a hate crime becomes this almost this kind of like major focus. Are you gonna acknowledge it's a hate crime or not? And so hate crime here, the, this kind of demand for something to be called a hate crime, it does a lot of work here, right? Um, it kind of, you know, sometimes it's, are you gonna acknowledge it's racist, right? Are you going to charge him with a hate crime and so forth? And so I wanna unpack some of the kind of specifics of hate crime law and hate crime policy because of the way that the term hate crime gets kind of widely debated and kind of argued about, right? So this information comes from Kay Whitlock and Kay Whitlock is somebody who's tracked a lot of what she called, you know, the hate frame, right? And she's written about the hate frame. So Kay Whitlock is, um, she's written policy papers and research papers you can easily find online. She also co-authored the book Queer Injustice with Andrea Ritchie and Joey Mogul. Um, and so um, this information comes from a, a policy paper from Kay Whitlock, right? So one of the things about contemporary hate crime laws is, you know, you read different timelines about when did they start, right? When did hate crime laws start? Um, you know, the Department of Justice and the Department of Justice is part of who, you know, the Attorney General's office and the Department of Justice is what will often investigate if a federal civil right has been violated. Right. And so if you go on the Department of Justice's website, they'll say, well, hate crime laws started with Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s regarding and they're referring to a certain clause and certain civil rights acts about, you know, um, and so forth. Um, Kay Whitlock, um, she draws our attention to kind of some of the laws that were going on in the 1870s and what would be reconstruction. And so along with the 14th and 15th amendments, there were also laws to hold both individuals and government officials accountable for restricting or violating the rights of black people, including the formation of the KKK. And one of the things that uh, uh, Kay Whitlock wants us to kind of uh, focus on here, um, if you read kind of her policy paper, is that, you know, hate crime law now focuses on kind of an individual against an individual in most cases, in most cases, we're gonna talk about some exceptions to that, right? An individual against an individual. So an individual being racist or sexist or homophobic and gets another individual um, because of that individual group membership, right? But what Kay Whitlock has emphasized here is that, you know, historically it was also about holding government officials accountable. So people who represent the structure or people who represent the state in some ways. And so you had a much more what we call robust kind of, you know, approach to trying to protect the rights of people and trying to um, hold people accountable in terms of the government officials here. These laws were rolled back by the Supreme Court to uphold states' rights over federal authority. And so this rollback, right, of kind of holding government officials and people who represent the structure in a particular way what Kay Whitlock has said is that this is kind of the logic of contemporary hate crime laws. Now we're focused mainly on kind of individuals who do acts of aggression towards somebody because of what we presume to be because of the um, aggression towards that person being a member of a group, right? Okay. So this is from the Department of Justice, right? So one of the things is with hate crime, 
some people think it's just, you know, the act itself of, of um, racism. But what it means is it's a crime that's recognized, an act that's recognized as a crime itself under law, right? And this is important because one of the things is, is that we use the term hate crime a lot of times very loosely as if the act of racism itself is a crime per se. But it means, for example, if you killed somebody, right? And if you get charged with manslaughter or murder or, you know, what degree murder. And then it's if they think that there is a motivation for that um, committing that crime uh, based on bias, that's what equals a hate crime. And one of the things that's really important to understand is that, um, you know, you have a federal hate crime law, but you have state hate crime laws. And state hate crime laws also can vary because states can have different measurements of crime, right? Um, some states, you know, um, they don't measure a crime in the same way. You have some states, for example, that don't measure um, rape as rape if it's between people who are um, uh, of the same sexual, um, people who are gay, right? Um, I found that out the hard way. I knew a man who, um, he was brutally murdered. He's a gay man, he was brutally murdered. And there were these questions about if a sexual assault had been involved. And I was reading um, the story about this man's death. Um, and you know, it was pretty intense reading this story because I knew him. And I learned from reading this new story that in the state that he was killed in, um, it wasn't considered legally rape if it was between two men. Right, um, and so you have all these ways that um, you know crime gets measured differently in different states, and that plays a role in terms of what even kind of um, you know how uh, sentencing in terms of this and that, and also do states act with kind of putting on enhanced penalties, right? And so an enhanced penalty can basically be: um, do you add kind of extra kind of penalties or sentencing guidelines um, based upon if you think it was motivated by bias. Sometimes what they'll try to do is sometimes they might uh, change something from, you know, second degree to first degree, right? So they might kind of change the degree of the crime, of the same crime um, legally to uh, a different degree as, as a way to try to account for what they think is this motivation, right? And so this is something where, you know, when we're talking about hate crime, right, we might be talking about it uh, casually, but it means something technically to the state, right? Now, here, right, at the federal level, right, a crime motivated by bias against race, color, religion, right? Now, this is something I want us to bookmark, right? Bias or hate incident. Okay. Because this is something that I'm want to. i going to talk about a little bit more when we get to the Stop um, Asian Hate hashtag, as well as some of the contemporary data sources that are being used in this conversation. Right? So I want us to bookmark this. But this is from the Department of Justice. They distinguish between a hate crime or a bias or hate incident. Right? Acts of prejudice that are not crimes and do not involve violence, threats, or property damage. Um, one thing you're seeing right now is a lot of... Uh, cities or states um, passing anti-bias um, uh, kind of policies. You're seeing colleges and universities and, 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 and uh, job, uh, workplaces passing anti-bias incident stuff, right? And so I want us to bookmark this because this conversation about hate crime and about bias incidents, um, it's, it's shaping a lot of different kind of institutional policies in ways that I don't know if we're always kind of cognizant of, okay? But so here are bias categories. And one thing that's happened is that you have, we're gonna go back to that in a moment. Um, you have different kind of biases that get added over time. And so since the 1960s, you've had increasing number of kind of um, uh, categories of what would be seen as the basis of um, trying to violate somebody, right? So this is gonna be something we wanna bookmark this Hate Crime Statistics Act for when we get to the part about contemporary data sources that's part of this conversation about stop Asian hate. So in 1990, um, this is when, you know, one of the things that's going on right now is this idea that we need to collect more data, right? And that if we had better data collection and better data collection methods and reporting methods, that we would have a better handle on how to address 
racial violence. And so, or um, uh, different types of what is labeled as hate crimes. So in 1990, Congress passes the Hate Crime Statistics Act and it's the, it mandates the collection of hate crime data. This is the first publication out of this, right? Um, not a very you know, snazzy cover, but this is the first publication. And this data is, um, uh, this data is uh, under the FBI, right? The Attorney General delegates responsibilities, right? They decide kind of the uh, responsibilities for collecting this data. And it's part of the Uniform Crime Reporting. And the Uniform Crime Report was one of the first national uh, like data sources for national crime, right? If you go on the Bureau of Justice Statistics, bjs.gov, right? That's, uh, you know, a lot of us who uh, do analysis or studies of uh, uh, crime and criminal justice systems, we're familiar with BJS.gov, Bureau of Justice Statistics. But Bureau of Justice Statistics is kind of a clearinghouse. It's where all these different sources of data are provided and sometimes kind of, you know, um, you know, cleaned up and put in these reports to make them look like they're national data. But those data sources can come from different police districts. They can come from different states. Um, they can come from, you know, um, U.S. Marshal Service, Bureau of Prisons, the Department of Corrections, right? And so, and again, a lot of these states have different kind of reporting guidelines. And one of the things that happens to is that a lot of crime data um, is, is not always required for local police departments to have to supply, right? And so this is also something that people have raised about kind of collecting crime data. Um, this is something people have raised about police brutality data. Um, as you've had sometimes the federal government saying, oh, we're gonna start kind of you know, monitoring data and collecting data. This question about, is that data required? Do you actually have to hand it over, right? Um, police departments don't actually have to, aren't required to report a lot of this data. Um, so the Uniform Crime Report, the UCR, it's one of the first major, it's one of the first national data sets, a, a da not data sets, but it's one of the first reports to kind of report on national crime patterns, right? And it's from the FBI. And there's a lot of really interesting scholarship about the history of the UCR and kind of the uses of it. Um, in particular, one of the uses of it was to give legitimacy to the FBI and to kind of help people think that there were quote unquote national crime waves, right? So in 1994, right, you have a, so you have a series of acts, right? And so remember, this is the time period of where you have a lot of, you know, examples of racial violence against Asians and other groups, right? Some of that I, you know, already talked about. So in 1994, they update the Hate Crime Statistics Act. And this means, you know, and what you see is a lot of the Hate Crimes Acts is expanding kind of the categories of um, who gets targeted. So a lot of us are very critical of Biden, President Biden for his role and President, you know, um, uh, President Biden, who was obviously not president then, but also President Bill Clinton for some of these policies, right? In terms of um, uh, violent crime uh, acts, right? Well, it's in some of these acts that you have kind of this expansion of hate crime policy, right? And so in 1996, the Church Arson Prevention Act, so you had a lot of black churches and you still do that um, are um, targets of uh, arson and racism, right? And so this means that collection of hate crime data becomes a permanent part of the Uniform Crime Report. But again, you know, police departments and, you know, this, they're not required to uh, supply this data, right? So yeah, you could say, oh, it's a permanent part, but they're not required per se. So Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. James Byrd Jr., um, goodness, I remember reading the newspaper article when that case happened. He was a black man that, um, uh, you know, Larvesta Gaither, Larvesta Gaither, the writer who uh, published for years, The Gaither Reporter. He has an essay in Joy James's book, States of Confinement. And the essay is called All the Brother Wanted Was a Ride. And he talks about James Byrd and about James Byrd, you know, thought he was uh, getting a ride from two, uh, from a couple white guys and those white guys killed him and they dragged his body and his body got dismembered in the process. Matthew Shepard was a white man, a white uh, gay young person who uh, um, uh, basically got, um, he was killed and he was kind of left to die in almost kind of a scarecrow fashion, right? And so these cases um, got a lot of national attention and, 
um, the LGBT community um, was very much a, a part of um, concerns about this case. Matthew Shepard, a lot of African-American civil rights groups were concerned about this case and people who were both black and LGBT were thinking about these cases, right? And so this was something where this act, I mean, look how, you know, this is, uh, you know, a fairly recent um, in our history, right? And these cases happened a long time before 2009. But this is where, right, they start to expand again, you know, against a particular gender or gender identity. And they also add juveniles, right? Um, as well as for crimes committed by and crimes directed against juveniles, right? Um, committed by and directed against, right? And so they're expanding also who can be an offender of a hate crime. Now, this is from the Department of Justice, but here what you see is, um, you know, you see these, three states here, right? They do not have hate crime laws, nor do they require data collection on hate crimes. The gray states have hate crime laws, but they do not require data collection on hate crimes. And then the blue states have hate crime laws and they require data collection on hate crimes. And so what you're seeing right now in this context of the discussion about anti-Asian violence is more people trying to have everybody be a blue state in this case, right? Now, one thing is hate crime laws have gotten a lot of public support, right? From police institutions, um, you know, uh, whether or not they actually care about crime, obviously, you know, as people point out, the police aren't necessarily concerned about racism or sexism or homophobia or transphobia. And they often are the ones who help to either enforce it or victimize people um, uh, because of it. But you have gotten this public support for hate crime uh, law. And so this is the International Association of uh, Police Chiefs, right? And, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is you see, right, here's, you know, um, Department of Justice talking about why, you know, it's so important to have, you know, uh, more hate crimes reported, right? And here is, you know, from the Department of Justice from uh, um, their crime statistics report in 2010, they're talking about all these organizations that have publicly supported hate crime law. Right now, again, some people will say, you know, that's a bunch of, you know, whatever, they're just kind of doing some PR. But I want us to look at why some of them publicly say hate crime law is important, right? And so they talk a lot about victims, right? And this kind of idea of being concerned about victims, right? They also talk about how hate incidents create community wide unrest. And so this idea of kind of prosecuting hate crimes might help quell political rebellion or kind of political dissatisfaction, right? Also though, right, they talk about, you know, um, you know, failure to respond to hate crimes within departmental guidelines may jeopardize public safety and leave officers and departments open to increased scrutiny and possible liability. So there's also this idea, you know, part of what the police have been very concerned about is their public image. Right. So people have talked about copaganda. Right. Um, you know how you see a lot of these videos of police officers dancing and, you know, it's like, oh, the police officer is dancing with the crowd or they're kneeling and all this stuff. Right. So there's various forms of copaganda that police have actively kind of been involved in. And what you see is within kind of liberal discourse is this idea of police, you know, community relations being reformed. And you see that through conversations about quote unquote mistrust, right? And well, groups mistrust the police and how do we build quote unquote trust, right? And you see some policymakers pushing that line. And so one of the things is, is that this hate crime discourse, right? Some of these police organizations find kind of dealing with hate crimes is actually useful for kind of police community relations in terms of kind of PR and less opposition to the police, right? And I think this is something we should think about in this moment of, you know, people talking about defund the police and abolition of the police. How do certain kind of demands get, you know, and these would be, you know, what people might see as a non-reformist reform, but how do certain demands help with some of the PR of the police according to even them? Right, that's something I think we should think about in this moment. Okay. Now, 
here's the hate crime statistics. This is in 2019. This is the most recent data available, right? So they talk about this reports on incidents and offenses, victims, offenders, where it happened, right? And so forth. And I want to show you some data points here that, you know, I talk to a lot of people about hate crime data and what's in there. And, you know, and a lot of people I've told sometimes are very surprised to find out kind of what gets measured and what doesn't, right? So here, for example, let's look at this, right? This is um, who were the victims? 15, 7% were victims of anti-white bias, right? So one of the things is people often assume hate crime is a stand-in for us talking about racism or sexism or homophobia, right? But hate crime is really about saying, if you are a member of a group and we think you're targeted because you're a member of that group, right? And so white people have been viewed as victims of hate crimes. And I want us to think about the implication of that, right? What does it mean that, you know, our, the understanding of kind of hate here, right? Isn't really an understanding of racial power, right? So white people can be victims of anti-white bias, right? Um, here, gender bias, right? Men can be seen as victims of gender bias according to this, right? And sexual orientation, right? We're victims of anti-heterosexual bias. And so this is something where, again, if we're thinking about how do we, um, you know, hold people accountable for structural violence that manifests itself in terms of acts or behaviors or treatment of a group from an individual, right? We're dealing with a very murky kind of definition here of hate, right? It just means that we think that you being a member of this group, right, is the basis of why this crime happened. And again, a lot of this data is being reported by police departments. And so police departments are kind of, you know, prosecutors um, are kind of in a position to say, we think that there is something about you being white which is why you experience this, right? So this is offenders, right? Who were the offenders? Now, about half were white, but one of the things that people pointed out is hate crime laws have been used to try to um, target and add increased sentencing to um, you know, uh, not black and people of color, right? And so 23.9% of cases where you know they decided that a black person had targeted someone because of their race, right? Um, and so this is a significant number, you know, percent here, right? You also have Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Hawaiian, and so forth, right? And so people have talked about this. One thing, for example, is in South Carolina. Um, this was like a story in like the early 2000s. It was a new story and you can find it online, uh, some of these headlines. But in South Carolina, there was an anti-lynching law, right? And, you know, a lot of us know what the history of lynching is and who it was used against. But black people were actually being prosecuted, especially black young people were actually being prosecuted under this anti-lynching law because the way lynching was measured was, you know, two people who, uh, you know, um, you know, brutalize somebody else, regardless of race, right? And so black people were only a certain percentage of the population of South Carolina, but they were getting, you know, um, uh, uh, charged with this lynching law, right? And so you also have, and this is something um, uh, they talk about in uh, Queer and Justice in the book, and Kay Whitlock has talked about in some of her other work, but you've had, you know, LGBT people of color, right, who are sometimes defending themselves against, Sometimes maybe other LGBT folks were racist, right? Or, um, and so forth. And, you know, they might be defending themselves. And in the, in the point of defending themselves, they might, you know, kind of, you know, you know, call people, you know, whatever, whatever. And sometimes that's being used then to say, well, you know, and even if they were defending themselves because they might have used certain language or whatever, that's being used to kind of criminalize them, even though they were the victims or that they were structurally more vulnerable to being targeted, right? There's also this part, right? Um, you know, crimes against society. So victims, right? Victims of a hate crime can be 
an individual, a business, a financial institution, institution, government entity, a religious organization, or society public as a whole, right? And so one thing is you have, you know, 236 crimes against society involving 236 victims. This can include drug narcotics offenses, gambling offenses, right? And, you know, this idea of a victimless crime, right? But this idea that society has been, you know, victimized by this. And, and a lot of people don't realize that this is under hate crime law, right? Okay, so Don Beyer, right? Um, we're gonna move now into this conversation about the No Hate Act, right? And this was something that um, Don Beyer, a co-sponsor, right? With some other uh, Congress people, and he was responding, he says, you know, the, this report that we're just looking at some of the data, he said was so alarming because of um, some of the increases in it um, in terms of the numbers, um, some of the highest levels of hate crimes in over a decade and the numbers, the highest number of hate related killings on record. So he is pushing for a no hate act, right? The Jabera Higher No Hate Act, the house already passed it, right? Um, and so this is where here, right, um, supporting the speedy implementation, the latest crime reporting standards. So again, this whole idea of like data, right, kind of being an important part of, you know, solving some of the stuff, right, providing grants for the creation of state run hate crime hotlines, right, um, supporting law enforcement activities, right. Anytime you're talking about, you know, hate crime law, you're talking about more legitimacy for the police, and you're also talking about, frankly, more funding for the police, right? So when we're talking about defund the police, if you're calling for hate crime legislation, that kind of works against defunding for the police, right? And then creating accountability, okay? Now, this one is interesting here, right? Promoting understanding and healing by allowing for judges to require individuals convicted under the Hate Crimes uh, Act of 2009 to undergo a period of supervised release to include community service education centered on the community targeted by crime. So one of the things that we know is that there are all these type of diversion programs. People have written about diversion programs in terms of um, people being under supervised release, uh, probation or parole, um, and um, or under community supervision in some way. And they might be in a diversion program regarding addiction or mental health. Well, they're suggesting almost kind of, you know, diversion programs for understanding and healing, right? Okay. So now let's, we're going into the present moment here, right? So um, one of the things is, is that you see these kind of statements by, you know, acting U.S. attorney in different districts um, regarding anti-Asian hate crimes and bias acts, right? And this is something I want us to kind of pay attention to. We're looping back to when I said, let's pay attention to uh, how the Department of Justice distinguishes between hate crimes and bias incidents, right? And so they're talking about a couple of cases that happened there in um, the uh, region of the country, right? Now, this is something that I want us to kind of think about here. Um, we're going to go here and we're gonna loop back to uh, the two slides I just skipped, right? This is from President Joe Biden, right? So Joe Biden, who ran all those attack ads on China and had really xenophobic ads towards China, um, when he was running for president. He wants us to know that he does not stand for intolerance against Asian Americans or xenophobia, even though he ran all those attack ads on China um, and also Pacific Islanders, right? So he puts out this statement um, in uh, January 26, 2021. And one of the things that he's kind of made a point of is saying that, you know, my White House, right, will not, you know, say things like Kung flu and so forth, right? I haven't seen any statements from him about if he's gonna stop running attack ads on China and those racist ads, right? Um, now, here, right, March 4th, okay? So the White House has a listening session with Asian American Pacific Islander leaders on rising hate crimes and incidents, right? And again, these things are kind of being bundled together, hate crimes and incidents against Asian American communities. Okay. Now, this is Grace Meng and with um, uh, Senator Hirono, she is, um, uh, she is sponsoring a COVID-19 hate crime law. And I have to say this, you know, um, if you work in public health and you're concerned about kind of the intersection of public health 
and kind of the criminal justice system and carcerality. I think you should be paying attention to this act, especially because President Biden, he's kind of suggesting that he's gonna, he supports this type of act, right? So Grace Meng, um, she, you know, she, this is something where before May, she and Senate and, and others were already proposing legislation. So you saw headlines like in March saying they're proposing legislation to combat, you know, anti-Asian hate crimes or anti-Asian sentiment, right? Now they're proposing a specific COVID-19 hate crime act, right? So this is from the um, proposal here, right? The term COVID-19 hate crime means a crime of violence, right? That is motivated by, and so here's kind of, you know, classic hate crime kind of um, uh, categories, but also the actual perceived relationship to the spread of COVID-19 of any person because of the characteristic described, right? And I think this is something that, you know, um, you know, when I was reading this, I was thinking about, you know, I was riding a bus the last time I rode a bus was March 13th, right? I mean, I actually remember the day, okay? And around that time I was riding the bus, a group of black youth behind me were like having fun and kind of messing with each other. And they were like, I've got COVID, right? You've got COVID, right? And, you know, there are ways that people just kind of mess with each other, right? And, and within, you know, friendships that they have. And then there are sometimes ways people mess with each other with aggression. Um, like if we think about, you know, um, the, the video of the Uber riders, right? And um, them attacking uh, the car driver and him saying, I think they're doing it because I'm Asian, right? And, you know, but the way people are using COVID-19 a lot of times in their kind of, whether it's like banter, you know, the, between friends to kind of fuck with each other, right? or to fuck with each other aggressively between strangers, right? Um, you know, this is something that I think a lot of us who are concerned about uh, criminalization and, you know, the way kind of valid public health concerns, right? But criminalization, right? Um, I think we should be paying attention to this act, right? Because what's happening is this conversation about wanting to kind of protect Asian Americans from racial violence is being used in a very particular way in this situation that I think um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about the consequences of if this act passes, okay? Now, here we go. So President Biden, right, on March 19th, right? So this is something where, um, you know, he's saying, you know, this should be swiftly passed, right? Um, this happens, obviously, after, um, you know, what happened in Atlanta, right? The violent shootings and killings of people in Atlanta, right? And so what you see is conversations that were already happening um, and, and so forth are getting this kind of accelerated thing about like, you know, we need to swiftly do this, right? Or we need a quick response or, you know, we demand kind of accountability and so forth. So here we go. This is March 18th, right? Um, and so this hearing, right? This was one of the first hearings in like, you know, like three decades around anti-Asian violence. And so this hearing was already planned before what happened in Atlanta, but it happens like the day after what happened in Atlanta. And so this takes on this kind of significance in a different way, right? And one of the things that's very interesting is looping back to what I was saying about bias incidents, right? Is that you're seeing people saying, okay, in some of the you know, testimony, they'll say, well, all these incidents aren't hate crimes per se. And they're acknowledging that hate crime is measured in a very particular way and that there's a very particular process for if something actually gets classified as a hate crime right, in terms of investigation and so forth, right? But they're saying, but there are all these bias incidents, right? And so what's happening is violence here, right, involves both what has been legally kind of determined to be a crime, but also a range of bias incidents. And those bias incidents range in and of themselves. And so all of this is being kind of grouped under anti-Asian violence, but it's also all being grouped under this idea of kind of a crime wave right? A wave of crime against Asian Americans. And this is being used to kind of stampede, right? This idea of kind of, we need, you know, hate crime legislation to protect Asian Americans. So let's see here. One thing I want to go back to is, um, 
is let's talk about this here. So let's talk about some of the data that Asian Americans are creating to do this. So as I said, hate crime data is, you know, um, there's all these concerns about, are we collecting enough data? That's partly what's being pushed in some of these policy proposals and, and, and in terms of kind of better data collection, right? And so, you know, a lot of times what you have is sometimes people create their own data sets because certain data sources are not officially available. If we think about the emergence of these um, data sets regarding uh, police murders, like I think Washington Post has one and um, I forget the organization that has the other one, right? And some of these data sets are now starting to become kind of legitimized within academic research, for example, they're using these data sets, right? And so what you have is in the absence of a lot of times official data from the state or what people see as kind of negligent you know, data collection, you'll have organizations or you'll have individuals, right? Um, you know, cr uh, cr start collecting their own data. So we've heard a lot about this data set, right? From Stop AAPI Hate, right? And part of it is because the hashtag and they started a Twitter handle and so forth, right? But before their data set, right? This is Asian Americans Advancing Justice and they have different locations uh, throughout the country. And this is, you know, uh, uh, from a while back, right? New website will track and expose hate incidents against the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And so, um, you know, they launched this website to collect this and to track incidents, right? And so this is interesting here, right? So they're talking about hate incidents. These are not necessarily things that would be officially labeled a crime or that are collected in kind of criminal justice data. And it doesn't necessarily mean that people went to the police, obviously, right? But here we see this term hate again, and this can mean a whole range of things, right? So then, you know, it says, tell your story, help us track hate, right? report now, right? And you can go online and read a lot of different incidents and so forth, right? So they're not getting as much attention in the conversation as Stop AAPI Hate is. And Stop AAPI Hate keeps getting cited for their national report and, and not only gets cited kind of in media, if you look at different media stories, they keep citing this. So this is kind of a conversation about data literacy here, right? They keep citing this data right? You had different people who are associated with this organization be part of testifying and so forth, right? And so this data source, as well as the hashtag, is also part of what's kind of mobilizing this hate crime uh, statistics um, uh, collection, but also the passage for kind of tougher legislation, right? Now, I want us to look at this national report here, right? So the report covers 3,795 incidents. So this is the one that keeps getting cited everywhere, right? And it's seen as kind of for the year, right? And one of the things is, is one of the people who's associated with Stop API Hate said, you know, I was reading one story where they said, yes, you know, now all these incidents are uh, physical violence. There's a lot of different incidents, right? Um, I want us to look at what were some of the things that got reported here, right? So this is, their, this is their data here, right? So verbal harassment and name calling, right? Avoidance and shunning, physical assault, right? Other, coughed at, spat on, online, workplace discrimination, bar from establishment, vandalism, graffiti, bar from transportation, right? And so what you see here is a lot of these incidents, right, don't involve physical violence, right? And they also, you know, um, some of the stuff is shunning. And I found that really interesting, right? This, you know, um, and so forth. And so if we look at where people experience this violence, right? Um, this harassment, business, public street, sidewalk, online, public park, public transit, private residence, school, other university, place of worship. And so this is something that we want to think about, what does it mean that the term hate encompasses all these different activities, right? And that hate is also being used sometimes interchangeably with violence, right? And how this is being used to kind of mobilize um, tougher, you know, kind of hate crime laws, right? Criminal justice kind of re, uh, responses, right? Um, to things, right? Now, another data source that keeps getting a lot of attention, right, 
in the conversation is this data source. And this data source is from the Center for Study of Hate and Extremism. And one thing that Kay Whitlock talks about that I think is really interesting is she talks about how there's this whole kind of development of um, hate studies and hate institutes that develop, right? So there's this whole kind of institutionalization of the study of hate. So this organization put out this report and this report has gotten a lot of attention. So if you keep hearing this uh, percentage, uh, anti-Asian hate crimes have surged 149%. This is an updated version. So they corrected their version and they released this uh, March 21st, I think. They released the updated version. So now it's only 145%, right? But I want us to look at these numbers here, right? So on one hand, these are, this comes from police data of uh, the 16 largest cities in the country, right? So originally in 2019, there were 49 cases. Now there are 120. This is not to say that this is not a 145% increase, it is. And this is not to say that it's, I mean, this is terrible, right? And this is obviously an undercount because this is, you know, who the police decide had a hate crime, right? Um, this is not, you know, all the people who experienced something. This is not all the people who even reported it, right? But this is something that I want us to think about is you could literally have one person experience something. And then if three people experience something the next year, you could say it increased by 200%, right? And so when you keep getting 145%, 145%, 145% as a surge, right? Part of what's happening here is that this discussion about anti-Asian violence, it's helping reproduce this idea of a crime wave, right? And one thing scholars have talked about is they talk about the, the significance of crime wave discourse, that the media helps construct this idea of a crime wave, right? And so if we can think about some of these kind of headlines, right, um, that people are writing, you know, to talk about crime, right? Um, right now, you have a lot of journalists and media folks who will say, and another incident, and another incident, and another incident, right? And so you have the media who participates in part of, you know, the discussion of a crime wave. Um, you also have, you know, actual incidents that are happening, right? So this is not to take away from it. But this is also something where I want us to go back to this hashtag here, right? You've had this debate about this hashtag and part of the debate is people say, well, I mean, the debate goes from everything to, should we use AAPI? So people are resurrecting old essays saying, stop saying AAPI because Pacific Islander is an Asian. Some people will say, well, AAPI, you know, you're only thinking of East Asians, right? And so then there's this debate about, you know, what about the Brown Asians, right? Some people will say, well, don't use hate because hate is a carceral term because it's connected to hate crime. Or some people say, don't use hate because um, hate is something that is too, um, they'll say it doesn't deal with white supremacist terror. So some people have said, we should say, stop white terror, or stop white racism or stop white supremacy, right? But one of the things is, is that even when people have been critical of carcerality and self-identify as abolitionist, right? And so um, you see a lot of people who are using this hashtag and now it's gotten the kind of official Twitter stamp with the weird flower, right? And so you have both stop AAPI hate and stop Asian hate. And what you're seeing is under this hashtag on social media um, and also like in think pieces and so forth, so many Asian American grievances are getting kind of put under this hashtag. People are saying things like erasing the work of women and femmes who do this labor is anti-Asian violence. Some people talk about their names being misspelled um, or mispronounced. Some people are talking about, um, you know, people's old tweets from when they're 17 years old. Right. People are talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, some commentary or a meme somebody put up. Right. Some people are talking about violence that they experience. Some people are talking about being sexualized. Right. As Asian women. Basically, this hashtag has become kind of a space to tell a range of kind of Asian American grievances. Right. But this is also helping mobilize this idea of kind of a wave of anti-Asian violence and anti-Asian crime. And if we go back to kind of this thing here, right, about um, where the Department of Justice talks about the difference between bias or hate incident, right? 
One of the things the Department of Justice and other policing agencies will say is, hey, monitor hate incidents or bias because it's a way of collecting kind of you know, proof of a crime being motivated by bias, right? And so one of the things that happens is the state has a vested interest in kind of bias incidents being counted, right? And this raises a significant question for us, right? What does it mean for us to kind of want to share and to talk about all the racism that we've experienced, right? And about sharing, you know, um, the grievances we have, right? But what does it mean that under this umbrella, people are sharing everything from the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Chinese Exclusion Act, World War II internment, to um, being hassled on the street, to somebody's old tweets, to um, people being killed, right? There's a whole range of grievances that are here. And this is something, one of the reasons I don't use this hashtag is because I worry about this hashtag being part of the mobilization, right? For, you know, stuff like this, right? And so even if we're anti-carceral and even if we call ourselves abolitionists, I'm thinking about what work does helping mobilize this hashtag and helping mobilize this idea of a crime wave, right? And of tougher, you know, hate crime laws, right? Even if we say we oppose hate crime acts, right? And so I don't have the answer to this, but it's something that I've been thinking about. And so as I'm thinking about it, this is why I never use this hashtag because I'm watching all this happen and I, and I have some serious concerns about it, right? Um, and I've studied and taught about kind of how crime wave discourse gets used. And one thing media studies scholars talk about is how police forces and policing agencies benefit from the idea of a crime wave a lot of times because it helps give legitimacy to the idea that they're needed, right? And that can be used not only for kind of trying to uh, get tougher sentencing or hate crime laws, but also for funding, right? To say, we are needed, look at this crime wave that's happening, right? And so this is a question, what do we do with our grievances and what do we do with the violence that we experience and wanting to talk about it, right? Instead of having to bottle it in, these are very valid you know, things that we're thinking about and we shouldn't have to hold it in, right? But what does it mean that it's being kind of galvanized under this particular umbrella? And this umbrella is being galvanized by journalists, by legislators, by advocates. Um, and, and it's helping contribute, I would say, to this idea of kind of a crime wave, right? And, I, and I'm distinguishing between an increase in actual incidents, but how something gets kind of um, uh, messaged as a crime wave in a way that could benefit um, the police in a way that eventually harms communities, right? So we're going to go to the last section here, right? So one of the things is I want us to think about this debate about kind of black Asian solidarity. So I had been interested in how this conversation about anti-Asian violence was being merged with this. And you know, uh, uh, about a month and a half ago, what you saw was because you had some high profile situations. When I say high profile situations, there were situations where Asians got physically attacked or killed. And um, in some of those cases it involved a black perpetrator. And those became high profile situations partly because of um, the media and some celebrities using their platform and people putting up you know, rewards and so forth, right? And so those incidents got widely circulated and they became part of this conversation about black Asian solidarity. And so what happens is what you've seen is this idea of kind of a carceral response versus black Asian solidarity. So a carceral response would be call the police, put up rewards, hate crime legislation and so forth. And you've had some people say, well, we oppose the carceral response. And so we're gonna promote black Asian solidarity, right? Now I want us to unpack here what this kind of uh, uh, push for black Asian solidarity is doing and is it always as anti-carceral as we might think, right? So the 1992 LA rebellion, I've been studying this and you know, I've interviewed Korean immigrant store owners and I've done ethnographies about black Korean relations and conflict. And I've looked at banking and lending uh, from Korean banks to Korean businesses in the post LA environment, right? All this stuff, okay. These are some discourses that emerge about Black Asian solidarity. So after the 1992 LA Rebellion, where Korean immigrants, um, they lost about, they were about, there was about a billion dollars in property loss 
in um, the um, uh, uh, in the riot zones, as they call them, and about half of that was incurred by Korean immigrants, right? And so what you saw was this increased attention on Korean immigrants in black neighborhoods. That was already an area of scholarship, um, a lot of times done by sociologists of you know, entrepreneurship and so forth. But the conversation about black and Koreans um, became a bigger Asian American conversation after the LA rebellion. And so what you saw was a range of Asian American um, uh, authors, right, and artists um, and, and scholars started writing about Black Korean conflict, or they would reference, at least if their entire manuscripts weren't about it, they would reference Korean star owners, and regardless of the ethnicity of the Asian American author. And so the Korean star owner became kind of the stand in, right? You also saw Black people weighing on it. So you had, you know, if you think about Cornel West's Race Matters. Um, the very beginning of, you know, the book, the first sentence is about, you know, the LA rebellion being a multiracial, you know, rebellion, right? Um, you know, Manning Marable had a book Beyond Black and White where he talks about, you know, the LA rebellion. And so there was a series of discourses that start to emerge um, to talk about, you know, Korean store owners in that neighborhood, but also to talk about, um, you know, um, uh, the, the rebellions, right? So one was the idea that Korean immigrants were abandoned by the state in terms of the lack of policing. So this was seen as kind of a pro-carceral kind of response, right? That um, this critique that the police abandoned Koreans, right? Which desires policing in some ways, right? Another one was that Korean immigrants are caught in the middle between black and white, right? Um, and then these are the ones I wanna really focus on here because I think these two are really playing out in the contemporary landscape, right? So then there was this idea of mutual misunderstanding between black people and Korean immigrants and that Korean immigrants um, were the targets of misdirected rage, right? And what's interesting is Latinos participate a lot in the LA rebellion, but this conversation about Latino rage towards Koreans or Latinos being misdirected in their rage, you didn't have a whole body of scholarship on that. It really became this kind of political preoccupation um, about Black people's perception of Korean immigrants, right? And were Black people, um, uh, you know, misdirecting their rage at Koreans or were they really, you know, um, politically confused um, uh, and so forth? So here, right, this mutual misunderstanding, misdirected rage frames were used to do this, right? So you saw this whole push to promote the so-called hidden history of Black Asian solidarity. And so you had people who were writing about Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X. People talked about Grace Lee Boggs. People talked about Asian Americans and the Black Panther Party. You had a body of work that started to look at kind of, you know, forms of racial cooperation and social justice, right? Um, third world, you know, kind of solidarity politics, right? This stuff did exist, but it was not the norm for Asian America, right? Most Asian Americans were not part of political organizations. I mean, most people of any racial group are not part of political organizations. And most people of any racial group are not part of third world solidarity organizations. But what you saw is when people talk about kind of the history of black Asian relations, they often will kind of go to this hidden history, but this hidden history is not the norm. Right. And Asian Americans who participated in this hidden history will often talk about how other Asian Americans looked down on them. Right. They knew they were the minority in their communities. Right. There is also this interesting kind of shared oppression cultural exchanges. And this was not just academic or intellectual or artistic. You have programs like Soul to Soul. Get it right? So S E O U L to Soul, S O U L. So you had these exchange programs between Korean organizations and Black organizations. The Korea Society hired a Black woman who used to work for the Urban League to, you know, do outreach on behalf of the Korea Society when there was all these boycotts and protests of Korean-owned stores in Black neighborhoods in in New York City, right? And so you also had organizations, city governments, you know, human relations commissions in different cities who are also part of trying to build this cultural exchange. And basically what it was is that it was this assumption that when black people, um, you know, uh, protested or rebelled, right, and, and Korean uh, businesses were impacted, it was this idea that black people just didn't know enough about Asian Americans supposedly, or didn't know enough about the history of solidarity. 
It was also assumed that when Koreans were racist to Asians or, or to black people or called the police on them or you know, made uh, an exorbitant amount of wealth in the neighborhoods, it was assumed that they just didn't know the hidden history, right? And also what happened was people were encouraged to have a class analysis of the conflict that focused on corporations, capitalism, or globalization or imperialism. But they were really kind of discouraged from having a race analysis about Asian Americans potentially having not only relative power compared to black people, but also power over black people, right? And so you see a lot of this in the conversation. What happens is also this comparative racialization frame and so what you start to see is people saying, well, Asian Americans and black people, we are of course of racialized differently, right? But we have similarities in terms of how we're treated. And so you see, you know, that still circulating today, right? Um, and so this is something where this conversation I think is happening now, but it's happening against a slightly different backdrop. So today you have this growing conversation, thankfully, about defund the police and abolition. And Asian Americans, a lot of Asian Americans are participating in that conversation. And they're participating in not just on the discursive level, but on the organizing level and on the you know, actual practice of it level, right? And in the process, you also have you know, this conversation about Asian Americans confronting anti-Blackness. And there's a lot of debate about how, you know, is that sincere? Is it not, right? Is it just something that, you know, uh, you know, Asian Americans with platforms and think pieces are doing, but you actually have a lot of Asian American organizations, um, you know, trying to deal with this, whether they deal with it in a way that, you know, is satisfactory is another thing, but people are trying. And so it's in this kind of, you know, newer space that we can think about though, are some of these practices still happening? And one of the things that happens here is that, Carceral response is this, but people say, well, we'll keep each other safe or black Asian solidarity is kind of a way to challenge the carceral response, right? But part of the history of black Asian solidarity discourse has often been what some people could see as kind of disciplinary towards black people, right? Meaning, you know, um, even though it's talked about as mutual misunderstanding, there's often this assumption that black people are misdirected or that they've absorbed white supremacy, or that black people have, you know, um, uh, are treating Asian Americans as foreigners, right? And what happens is black people somehow get kind of positioned as having more kind of racial or national power to determine boundaries, right? And so this is something that is part of kind of this conversation is this idea that black people have to be kind of taught to you know, care about Asian Americans. And you saw some of this stuff going on. There were rallies that people had where black people were saying on the mic things like, I want people to know I don't have a problem with diverse neighborhoods. And I was watching and I was like, wow, this is interesting. And like, why do people feel the need to hear that? Why do they need to hear a black person say, I don't have problems with Asians, right? What is going on here that that's kind of expected, right? And so one of the things about the comparative racialization frame is it doesn't deal with certain things. So you have, for example, this idea that Asians have been racially invisible. And this is being galvanized right now. Um, a lot of think pieces and commentators are saying, well, part of the reason why you're hearing so much about our grievances is because we've had to be silent for so long, or we've been invisible for so long, or people, or we haven't been silent, but people haven't listened to us, right? And this idea of not being listened to as a racial minority group, that usually suggests a certain resentment towards black people. Anytime a racial minority group says, we have not gotten the attention we deserve as a minority group, it's usually kind of an underhanded way of saying black people have gotten too much attention. Or it's an underhanded way of saying people in power have given black people too much attention. And so there's this way where, you know, I'm kind of interested in how this kind of idea of black Asian solidarity is, I'm wondering if this is still operating here, even in the contemporary framework, right? And this idea of kind of, we keep each other safe. You know, one of the things is, is that there's this idea that Asian Americans are vulnerable to racial violence because people don't understand our story. That was actually a discourse that played out with Korean immigrants post LA. People would say, well, they were targeted 
And rage was misdirected at them because people didn't know their story of imperialism or globalization or what they struggled with as immigrants, right? And right now what you're seeing is kind of a variation of that where people are saying, well, Asian Americans, you know, um, why are we experiencing this racial violence? It's also this idea that we can resolve it by getting people to know that we are racial minorities and that we experience this, right? But it's also this idea that we have not gotten the visibility or the attention we deserve and so forth. Now, I would say there's some truth to that, right? Asian Americans, a lot of our experiences with violence and racism are um, not given a lot of sociological attention. Um, it's not given a lot of media attention. And right now what you're seeing is this kind of, you know, avalanche, right, of grievances, and you're seeing an avalanche of kind of media support, right? Um, but one of the things is, is that we're assuming that if we just do counting, right, if we say, okay, well, we have all these grievances and so forth, that this proves, right, that, you know, um, you know, something, right. But this is something I think I want us to uh, think about, right, is this point by um, uh, Frank Wilderson here, right. He says shared experiences in the realm of the social do not necessarily index shared positions in the realm of the structural, right. And so Asian Americans, we can count and we have numerous experiences of racism, race incidents, violence, right? A range of different types of incidents. We have those experiences, right? They are real, right? And they often are not given uh, visibility on an empirical level, right? Um, in terms of attention, right? But one of the things I think that the Black Asian Solidarity Discourse doesn't deal well with is that we go to the comparative racialization frame where we say, well, we're racialized differently, but we don't often deal with this, right? And one of the things about, you know, it's not just about Black people experiencing things worse, right? Which actually by most sociological indicators, Black people do experience things worse than other racial groups. You can look at all the data on that, right? But it's about what positionality does do black people play in the social order that organizes everybody else's freedom or oppression, right? And so, you know, this realm of the structural, right? Um, if we think about opposition to the social welfare state, right? Research shows that because of anti-black racism and because of the way people associate welfare, and we know welfare is used by a range of people of racial groups that not everybody uses welfare and all that stuff, right? But research shows opposition to black people shapes a lot of opposition to civil rights policies that could help all of us. Research shows that opposition to black people show, shapes housing values and neighborhood values and appraisals. Research shows that opposition to black people or perceptions of black people shapes people's perceptions of crime, right? Um, whether or not whoever is you know, uh, doing quote unquote crime, right? And so black people occupy a particular space and anti-blackness operates in a particular way where it structures how we're all kind of um, understood or measured against, right? And how we're all kind of evaluated. Um, and I think this gets lost when we're talking about kind of the demand for Asian American visibility. We could bring more visibility to Asian American um, suffering. Um, I think we should, right? Um, but, that visibility doesn't really undermine this point, right? And I think that's something that I'm interested in uh, the kind of contemporary conversation maybe grappling with more. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tamara, for all of this wisdom, all of this knowledge. Um, I wanna thank everybody who is watching on Zoom and on YouTube. My name is Lily Philpott. I'm the programs manager at the workshop. Um, it's been a real pleasure to see the community in the chat, the sort of simultaneous conversations and the links, the, um, the knowledge sharing that is happening. So we're really grateful that you all joined us, grateful for your patience as well with our technical difficulties at the start of the hour. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. If you're on Zoom, you can drop questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're on YouTube, you can put them in the chat. Um, I'm sure there are plenty and we will get to as many as we can. Um, so Tamara, I'm just going to start and we'll, again, get through as many as we can. 
Um, <clears throat> so Robert Chung is asking, how do we best have constructive discourse on the volume of Black on Asian crime as of late while not furthering anti-Black narratives and rhetoric? Okay, wait a minute. Did you say Robert Chung? I did. Robert, is this you? <laughs> Lily, ask him if it's him. The chat is saying yes. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> Hi, Robert. <laughs> okay, so Robert, is this you? What's he gonna say? No, right? <laughs> Wait a minute, I just gotta say back to Robert. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this chat. You know what, Robert? Is this Robert, the, the Robert I know? I wanna say, is this the Robert I know? Can you, yes? I will watch in the chat to see. I'm not sure. Okay. So I know a Robert Chung, he was great. And he, uh, and I think this is the Robert Chung I know. He was one of my former students, right? Um, and he also was trying to encourage me to do stand-up comedy. So if you ever see me on a stand-up comedy stage, we can blame him, okay? Um, so could you repeat the question again, please? I was just, when you said Robert yeah. Chung, I just wanted to like. The question is, how do we best have constructive discourse on the volume of Black on Asian crime as of late while not furthering anti-Black narratives and rhetoric? I mean, I think this is, this is a question that I'm struggling with. So, and I know it might sound like, you know, I'm trying to, but I'm, I'm actually struggling with that. I think it's about, I'm not sure. Um, uh, um, Sorry, I'm looking at a text from somebody I really like. Okay, um, but I'm listening to you. So the thing is, you know, I'm not sure. I think this is part of the, the kind of challenge, right? One is, I think it's a challenge, not just for Asian Americans, right? What does it mean to actually talk about our grievances and to want accountability for them? I think that's a, a big question for all uh, targeted communities. Um, and what does it mean to kind of want, um, want protection. This is something I'm actually struggling with. I've been thinking a lot about what does, um, you know, people are debating this question about the state versus governance, right? And this is a question that abolitionists are debating, right? What does it mean, to, you know, um, what do we want the state to do? Can the state do anything but violence, right? Some people say, well, state violence is, you know, um, redundant. Um, and then some people say, well, we actually need governance. So when we talk about abolition, we're often talking about kind of what we want from the system that we think will give us some form of abundance like healthcare or um, you know, public education is social good or you know, and so forth. But I've been thinking a lot in this presentation, planning for this presentation, one of the things I've been thinking about is you know, what is our right to demand in terms of protection, right? You know, what does it mean to expect institutions to protect us? Some people will say, well, you know, they don't love us, institutions won't protect us and so forth. But there's something where I actually think it's fair to expect, you know, um, uh, people to be protected. Um, you know, and this is something if we think about reconstruction, but also if we think about just a lot of civil rights, you know, acts, um, it was about saying the federal government has a responsibility to not allowing us to be you know, um, to, to live a slow death, right? Um, and, and I've been thinking a lot about like, what should we be demanding that isn't, you know, tougher hate crimes or legislation or crime control? And this question about can we demand protection from institutions and can we demand protection from the state that isn't inherently kind of carceral or that couldn't be flipped into a carcerality? And that's something I'm struggling with. And so this is a bigger conversation I think about governance and, and, and what do we think uh, that means in terms of protecting, you know, groups that are gonna be targeted for violence, right? Um, you know, when I look back at Asian American activism, part of the reason why I told that story, it wasn't this kind of gotcha thing. It wasn't like these organizations were trying to figure this out and some of them called the police and some of them didn't. You know, they're tasked with something just so major. They're, they're experiencing, this racism, they're experiencing, you know, uh, threats of violence, um, and they're trying to figure out, like, how do they protect themselves, 
right? And, and that's not a small task. And so there's a certain sympathy I have towards them thinking about that in these Asian American organizations I spotlighted. Um, and I'm, I'm st trying to sort this out. So thank you, Robert. Officially, I don't know, right? But I just wanna say, if this is the Robert Chung I know, I'm so just moved that you joined us on this, on this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, this is from an anonymous attendee. He says, what can the primarily white staffed, often corporate sponsored media ecosystem equitably, especially considering that local and independent newsrooms have been disinvested for in for decades? Will they only self-correct with incentives? What could those incentives look like? So, you know, I have a feeling that people are like, I'm going to ask my question anonymously since she keeps saying, is this the so-and-so I know, right? So, okay, right? <laughs> You know, that's a big question. I think that is a question that, um, I think this is an interesting moment for Asian American writers and journalists and people who, you know, I have my thoughts, but I would say that there are a lot of Asian American journalists who um, I think have thought about the racial politics of their workspaces and the racial politics of what content and what kind of analysis they're allowed to put um, and even some of the analysis they might be putting out, I might not even agree with, right? But I do think that um, I would say I'm not the best one to answer that, right? People are gonna be like, bitch, please, can you answer a question, right? But I'm saying, you know, I might not be the best one to answer that question. And I think there are a lot of Asian American journalists who are having this conversation um, that would probably be better to answer that question than me. Um, this next one is from Anna Wen. As you noted, the hashtags, the follow the data or imperial vocabulary, hate crime as a category are inadequate, but we see these very terms intersect into solidarity discourse. What might be an alternative to the state and carceral language, which so often seeps into our everyday language practices? Uh, this is a good one. Um, and you know what? I <laughs> You should be like, bitch, answer a question. But I really, this is, these are big questions, right? Because part of it is, I think, you know, I've been kind of curious, you know, you, and so I'll just talk about some of the debates that are going on. So you do see people say, you know, um, you know, stop white terror, right? And then what I saw is I saw some people say, listen, Asian Americans, and these were non-Asians who were saying, they're saying Asian Americans, they're using stop Asian hate. I'm going to use stop Asian hate. I'm going to, I'm going to use it, right? As a solidarity. I'm not going to try to replace it, right? So there's all these debates about the hashtag themselves that I actually think is pretty healthy. I think part of the, the question I have is when we're debating the hashtag, is it about trying to increase the diversity of the hashtag, right? And so that's why I was saying, like some people are saying, oh, you stop Asian hate instead of stop AAPI hate. But that's really just this kind of diversity question about like, you know, you're not recognizing me as part of it. And I'm more interested in this question about kind of how does the hashtag itself, what is it mobilizing, right? Part of, to me, thinking about politics isn't just, um, it's not just about, you know, kind of, you know, uh, a critique it's kind of like what what is the way we're trying to kind of live in the world and trying to create that and how are we mobilizing that and one of the things about stop Asian hate I've been thinking a lot about this is that I feel like it plays up on this idea of like that we're all afraid and that we're all full of fear and that we're all kind of traumatized right and I'm not trying to take away from the fact that people might feel grief and this and that. I definitely felt it. You know, I burst into tears in my class uh, last week and I, I got students kindly emailing me being like, are you okay now? And all this stuff, it's very sweet, right? But there's this way where part of what the Stop Asian Hate does is it, it's like it locate, it, it, it kind of in, ends up us articulating this positionality as if we're like kind of in this constant set of fear and constant set of kind of vigilance about, you know, uh, violence. And I've been thinking about what this idea of like, you know, obviously we have to be vigilant because of racism and because, you know, of stuff. So there's this way where you're kind of always aware of it, but there's this way where it's almost kind of, it's, it's mobilizing a community around kind of fear. And I don't know if it's mobilizing a community around kind of what is our vision of the world we want. And, and what is the vision of the world we have? I don't wanna like, 
I don't want to walk around in fear. And part of that's a material reality, right? What is around me that makes me walk around in fear? But I also, I just don't want to, the world I want isn't me, you know, constantly being like, right? Like everything becomes carceral, right? And, and one of the things that happens is I've been thinking a lot about how the way we're encouraged to view things is often through a carceral lens. Like, a, you know, people, the, the, the 76-year-old Asian woman who got, you know, punched in the eye, right? And I, I, you know, watching those videos of her and watching the interviews with her were just terrible. I mean, just sad, right? But I, you know, some people are like, well, that's attempted murder, right? And there's something where I'm like, we're kind of being encouraged to see everything through a language of crime and everything around like racism. Like, I don't know if I'm prepared to see racism only through a language of crime partly because I don't think it actually can do the work of articulating what I think racism is. And I don't think it can help me like deal with the levels of vulnerability I actually have as an Asian person, right? So we're encouraged with Stop AAPI, I hate to think that violence is always gonna be from somebody who hates us because we're Asian, right? Most of us are gonna be violated by someone we know. That's just intimate partner violence domestic violence or people in our geography, right? A lot of us are gonna be violated by someone of our own race. Do we have a vocabulary around that, right? And so the stop API hate thing is both carceral, but it also limits our kind of understanding of our vulnerability to structural violence. And it also encourages us to kind of only think about things within I think a certain kind of carceral lens that I'm just really struggling with. And so, I don't know what the answer is, but I, these are the questions that I'm working through and I'd like more people to work through them with. Well, and thank you so much. I think, I mean, everyone in the comments is, is sort of on board with this too and, and thinking through them the same ways. Um, I, I know it's, we're just past 8 p.m. on the East Coast. So I'm gonna ask just one more question um, because it is the Asian American Writers Workshop. We are a literary organization. Um, someone had asked, do you have any book recommendations about topics that relate to everything that has been talked about? Um, I'll expand that as well of just book recommendations in general. Well, okay, so this is going to be tacky, right? This is going to be tacky. Um, as you can see behind me, right, um, are a bunch of books of Miriam Kaba's, which I edited, right? So this is tacky. But one of the things I think is really useful in there that I think is useful for this moment is Miriam and Rachel Herzing talk about, um, and this is well said. There's gonna be a bunch of books that you could read about Black Asian solidarity and this and that. There's a bunch of books about Asian American politics. You're gonna see a lot of those books circulated on the internet and so forth, right? And you're gonna see reading lists. So those kind of lists are available to you. What I would say is when you're reading them, um, if you aren't, maybe you might be, you know, remain open to kind of the concerns I raised about that literature, right? And, and, and so forth. Um, but, what I would say, and a lot of people know about this book and, and, and so forth, so it's not to say that this book isn't, you know, getting attention on the internet. But one of the things that, uh, you know, was really challenging for me when I was editing it was um, Miriam and Rachel Herzing, who is one of, uh, someone who's been with Critical Resistance for years um, and a co-founder, they talk about, you know, abolition is not your fucking feelings. I mean, they're explicit and they say not your fucking feelings, right? I'm, I'm quoting them, okay, right? Okay, I'm quoting them, all right? Um, and that's really challenging. And I think that's something actually I've been thinking a lot about in this moment is about the kind of power of what that means, but also like what that kind of challenges us to do. Because what happens is with the mobilization around all these grievances, right? It is like, we go from kind of, this to this to this to this to this and it all becomes kind of under heat but also becomes all under like what we think needs to be dealt with and what we think other communities need to be dealt with we need to deal with and what we think has been ignored for so long and it becomes this idea of kind of we're mobilizing under this kind of recognition of it right mm -hmm. and one of the things i've been thinking about is just like you know what do we do with our pain right like what do we do with our very real hurt, our very real pain, our very real anger, our very real rage, right? Um, about the ways we have been violated as Asian people, the ways we get treated like shit, right? Um, and the ways that we often will get ignored for being treated like shit. And I've been thinking a lot about what do we do with like 
our pain. And what happens is, is that, you know, and scholars have talked about it, but it's something that you can kind of see is a lot of times these moments of racial violence, whether it was Vincent Chin, and especially what's happening with Atlanta, right? Is those become kind of stand-ins for um, how we see ourselves as a community in terms of whether it's our vulnerability, whether it's kind of what we think are the social factors that play a role and kind of how that happened, right? So it becomes this kind of conversation about community, but we don't often have to kind of talk about what is our own investment in that conversation in a particular way. So if you see some of the discourse, right, people will be like, like there's this idea that we're all in extreme grief over it. I'm not trying to take that away from people, but you can't speak for all the millions of Asian Americans and say, we are all in grief, we are all this. And so what happens is we use this language of kind of feelings to kind of build this kind of idea of a politic that exists among us, right? And, and I'm interested in kind of what do we do with our feelings? What do we do with the various feelings we have? But one is acknowledging we don't all have the same feelings or reactions, but also our feelings and reactions don't always have to be what we end up doing politically, right? And what happens a lot of times is feelings and reactions and kind of what we think we're supposed to feel, what we think other people are supposed to feel becomes some of the kind of mobilizing language of you know, what we think we should do uh, politically as a people. And these have big impacts, not just for us, like what we do politically as a racial group isn't just about us, right? If we're demanding hate crime legislation, that affects everybody. If we're demanding carceral kind of responses, that affects everybody, right? So we have this responsibility, you know, as we're thinking about us and as we're thinking about our feelings, we have a responsibility to think about like, what, what do we do with those feelings, right? And so that's something that I would recommend this book because, you know, Miriam talks about this in a couple of essays and in interviews, but she and Rachel Herzig talk about, about like, you know, how we have to kind of sort through our feelings. That's actually kind of part of thinking about abolitionist politics, because a lot of us are going to want revenge, or a lot of us are going to want prosecution, or a lot of us won't know what to do, right? Like, a lot of us don't know who to go to, right? And a lot of that not knowing becomes sometimes the substance that bonds people together, even when we haven't hashed out all of our political differences or even know each other, right? But it becomes this, you know, kind of shared we thing. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to think through a lot of that. And I think this book, articulate some of that. And I think that's actually the next level of struggle, even for abolitionists. In the introduction, I said, you know, some of that stuff about what do we do with our feelings, that's not just for like, you know, people are just thinking about this stuff. That's also for abolitionists to have to sort through, right? I mean, this stuff is really real that we're trying to figure out. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I just, for everyone watching, just to be, to give the title of that book. That is, We Do This Till We Free Us. Um, it's out from Haymarket Books, um, the incredible Haymarket Books. Um, I think this is all that we have time for, unfortunately. Um, I mean, fortunately, we have had you here with us this evening. We're so grateful for your taking the time to join us, for your wisdom, for this lecture. Um, I wanna thank everybody who joined us online, on Zoom and on YouTube, who's interacting in the chat and learning alongside us. Um, I want to share special thanks to our incredible ASL interpreters, Dresden and Stephanie, um, our captioner Kim from 2020 Captioning. Um, if you are interested in seeing more programs like this or learning more about AAWW, you can find us online at aaww.org. Um, and I believe if they haven't already, my colleague T is going to share something in the chat um, with Tamara's social media information so you can follow her work as well. Um, and, and continue celebrating and learning with her. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna keep the Zoom open for about 10 or 15 more minutes. We'll turn off our cameras and our mics, um, but if people wanna keep chatting and interacting in the chat, we will make some space for that at the end of the evening. Um, so again, huge thanks to you, Tamara. We're so grateful for your, for your knowledge and for sharing it all with us. Um, thank you so much from all of us at the workshop. We're really grateful. And thank you to everyone again, and especially to Stephanie and Dresden and to Lily and to T um, and to everybody else at AAWW who's involved in this. And thank you to everyone. And thank you for all the positive energy in the Zoom chat. I, you know, I wasn't able to keep up, but it's like, wow. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone.